So with that, I am very grateful for the classes of 1955 in allowing us to bring in and welcome Dr. Ken Ginsberg. Thank you. Thanks so much. I have to tell you, I've had a great day so far. First of all, your eighth graders were amazing. They were like so engaged, and you never know with, with uh, sixth through eighth graders, you never know what's going to happen. But it ended up feeling really, really great. But what made me really happy was the different meetings I've had with administrators and parents. And what's really clear to me is, you know, sometimes I go to schools. First of all, can you hear me? So sometimes I go to schools, and it's my job to change the way they think because the way they think is really harmful for children, all right? He, and sometimes I go to schools that has it all right philosophically. And then my job is to just serve as a catalyst and make sure that people kind of buy into what the school's already doing. The good news is it's that category here. Everything I've heard about how they think about the whole child and how they think about success so far, everything I've heard is right. That doesn't mean that everyone in the world is going to agree with you. And it doesn't mean that your child is not going to be exposed to some messages in the world that might undermine their long-term success. So we're here really thinking about what long-term success looks like. A couple other housekeeping points. I'm going to be talking till about 9 o'clock. I couldn't listen to anybody for an hour and 45 minutes. I really couldn't um, without moving around. So if you're somebody who, needs to, who wants to move around, take a break at any time, run up and down the sides, I think that's great. All right? Um, and the other thing, I just want to get a sense. Who has kids who are in elementary school or younger? Nice. So a lot of times what will happen is that uh, people, because they know I'm an adolescent doc, the younger folks won't show up. And actually, if you want to make healthy adolescents, when do you begin? Like when they're two, right? So this message, you're actually here at the exact right time. So let's begin and think. How do we define success? What are the things that you want for your child to be or to have in order to be successful? Name for me some things. Happiness. Give me another. Balanced. Confidence. Good relationships. Some other stuff. Emotional regulation. Passion. Pew. Say what? Resilience, thank you for that. Um, so, so the point is that um, what we have to know is when we're looking at our child, whether they're three years old or whether they're 18 years old, we have to really be keeping our eye on the ball. And we have to stop looking at the child before us and begin looking at the man or woman that's coming. Look at the 35-year-old. And when you really begin doing that and you begin parenting to raise an adult, an adult who's going to make a difference in the world and an adult who's going to be happy in the world, then suddenly the pressures that are on you during elementary school and get worse and worse through high school begin to dissipate. And you begin to realize that the messages that the other folks are saying aren't actually right. Okay, so now let's think about that healthy 35-year-old. We want them to be happy, but it's very different than in childhood. When you want your 4-year-old to be happy, you give them a cookie. When you want your 12-year-old to be happy, you give them a bike. When you give, want your 16-year-old to be happy, you give them a car, and you absolutely positively should not, okay? Um, but it's easy to make kids happy. What is a happy adult? A happy adult is someone who has the passion, someone who has a sense of purpose or a sense of meaning in life. What else do we need that adult to be? We need them to be hardworking to have tenacity, to have grit. Are you up on this word grit that we've been talking about for the last five, six years? Um, it is what it basically says, the bottom line is this. You're either going to run, see life as a sprint, or you're going to see it as a marathon. And when you see it as a sprint, then you run really fast to a goal right in front of you. You'll do whatever it takes to get to that goal, including cheating, including stepping on people. And we know that this generation of elite kids are cheating at higher levels than other kids have. We know that. Okay, and what else? If when you fall down and you're running a sprint, what happens to you? You've lost. When you're running a marathon, you're not even sure you can make it. You're thinking far in the distance. You're training for a very long time to really think about um, getting to a place where most people can't imagine getting. And then when you fall down, what happens when you run a marathon? Nothing. You get back up. What else do we want? We want our kids to be empathetic to be compassionate, to look at a human being and when something's going um, wrong with their life, rather than look at them and say, what's wrong with you? 
to look at that human being and say, how do I lift you up? What's going on with you? We want that kind of empathy in our kids. We want kids who are going to be creative and innovative because all of the best ideas haven't been thought of now. And if you look at industry right now and you look at what they're worried about, what they're worried about is that most schools are still um, teaching kids in terms of knowledge. And the whole movement of testing for the test is knowledge-based. And knowledge doesn't get you very far anymore. Now it is about innovative, it's about innovative thought, it's about creativity, it's about changing paradigms. That's what it's about. It's about knowing how to access information. When I graduated medical school, you had to know everything because if you didn't know it, you had to look it up on Index Medicus, you had to go to the library. It was really, really hard. You had to know things. Now, you honestly, I take out my phone all the time to give me answers. That's good medicine because think I have to know how to navigate that system. But we want, need kids to be creative and to be innovative thinkers. We need kids to be able to be collaborative to be able to work with human being, other human beings because you never come up with ideas on your own. And we need kids who are going to know what they're good at and what they're not good at so I can go, you know what? This one's on you. Let me take the back seat right now and learn from you. We need kids who are going to be coachable, who are going to be able to take constructive criticism. Because if you can't take constructive criticism, you will fail in the workplace. And we need kids who are going to be resilient. Because as much as you'd like to protect your kid from everything, it's just not possible. It's just not possible, right? So what you want is to prepare them to be able to navigate the waters. Does that make sense? So the, what I'm going to try to build a case for, not everything here is going to be about stress and academic stress, but about half of tonight's going to be. And I'm going to build a case, I believe, that the normal treadmill that most of these kind of schools are on are actually undermining the future adults in a very big way. And if you don't believe me, call industry, ask them about what it's like to work with the 20-somethings right now, the 20-somethings who have been front to the top schools, and they will tell you that they are very, very anxious, and that when they don't do well, and if you give them constructive criticism, they fall apart and you hear from their mothers. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. All right? So, do we have to make a choice between play, success, and happiness? Let me tell you, my girls are freshmen now in college, and um, I've been talking about this kind of stuff for like a decade. And I want you to know that when college admissions came along, I was really nervous, and I was really like, I hope I didn't screw up. Because there's no question that the decisions I made might have prevented them from going to Harvard. Not that they would have wanted to go, not that they would have gotten in. But if you parent in the way that I'm suggesting, it is possible, let me be straight to you, that your kid won't get into Stanford because Stanford is really right now about keeping their admissions below 6%. That's what it's about. Your anxiety is really good business. Really, really good business for them. And so, um, but if I had to make a choice between success long term and happiness for my kids, hands down, I would have chosen success. I would have held my nose doing it but I would have chosen success because they're only on my watch for 18 years and then, God willing, they're going to have another 102 years here, right? I would have chosen success without a doubt, but what I know is that that is a false choice, all right? So what does getting into a top college get you? What getting into a top college gets you factually is your first job. That's what it does, all right? And how long is this generation of kids staying at their first job, do you know? So it's a little bit less than two years. It's 18 months to two years. What gets your, your second job? Yeah, it's your first job, right? So does that second boss call the first boss and say, how did she do in her ACTs? Did she make captain of the lacrosse team by senior year? Did she play the bassoon, right? So what are the questions that they're asking? How, does she work with others? Is she coachable? Does she learn on the job? And that's about taking constructive criticism. Is she creative? Right? These are the ideas. The very pressure that we are putting on some of our most elite kids is actually undermining all of these ingredients you need for long-term success. So hold your breath. And as other parents are telling you, don't you want to make sure he gets into? Say, actually, I'm wanting him to find the right match, but I'm really wanting him to be a successful adult. Boom. End of conversation. <laughs> all right? Um, so, uh, now play, all right? So let's talk about kindergarten for a minute, all right? Let's talk about childhood. Does play 
teach you creativity, innovation, how to get along with others, when to step out, how to take constructive criticism, damn straight. So when we think that we have to get ahead right now when the kid's in kindergarten and undermine what every mammal does to figure out how to grow, which is play, we are really hurting our kids in a big way, in a very big way. Um, so uh, let's move on. Let's talk about resilience now. Resilience is about the ability to overcome adversity. It's about the capacity to bounce back. To understand what it is, you have to understand that it is a mindset. It's about how you think, all right? To understand um, resilience, you have to understand stress. Stress is about the fact that we all come from the jungle. We all come from the jungle, and everything that, it, that, make, that we feel when we're nervous is about the fact that we are designed to be able to run from a tiger or a wolf pack. That is how we are designed. And so many things happen in our bodies to make us survive. So one of the things that happens is our heart beats fast. We get stomach cramps. We'll explain why later. There's all these things that happen so that you can survive. Your pupils get big so you can jump over a log if it's dark. All of these things are designed to help you survive. One of the other things that happens when you are running from a tiger is you're not supposed to have very effective communication with that tiger. Really, can we work it out? <laughs> right? You are supposed to be running. And what actually happens is that the blood leaves your, the part of your brain that is the thinking part of your brain into the part of your brain that is the frog part of your brain that says slither, jump away. Have you ever had the experience of going blank? Going blank is literally the blood going whoosh to frog brain. So if your child believes that an AP bio test will determine his life, don't be surprised when frog brain gets turned on and he goes blank. So the mindset of resilience is about knowing what is a real tiger versus a paper tiger. With the bottom line being, if it can't chew your face off, it's not a real tiger. All right? Resilience is uneven. You can have a kid who it is a complete bear at home, like incredibly difficult, but part of the reason is that he's a perfect little boy at school. You can have difficulties at home, and as a result, that kid is going to be a perfect little boy at home because he doesn't want to stress anybody out. He doesn't want, he doesn't want you to be disappointed in him, and then he's, all of a sudden you're going to hear he's um, awful at school. Resilience is not invulnerability. So I've written textbooks on how to make kids resilient. I've written parenting books on how to make kids resilient. I've raised um, two kids who are now 19. Are they invulnerable? No. It's not the same thing. Let's go back to the beginning of the definition of success. We wanted our kids to be empathetic, to be warm and compassionate. Can we agree on that? Where do you get that from? Is that a genetic trait? You get that from experience, right? In my own life, we all have our own lives. In my own life, you know, um, I've had an amazing life. I'm 53, an amazing life. The um, only thing that happened that it was bad for me was 17. When I was 17, I was really incredibly depressed and really kind of passively suicidal. I wanted to die all the time. Never did anything, but wanted to. Um, and who did I go to for help? Who do you think? Nobody. Nobody, because I was funny, so I could lie about it, and nobody knew because it was 1979, and it wasn't cool to have these thoughts and feelings. What have I done with my life? I've lifted teenagers up. I create national policy on how to decrease shame and stigma in organizational policy, on how to decrease shame and stigma among kids. Thank God for 17, right? So for those of you who have kids who are particularly anxious, who sometimes are depressed, who really are full of emotions, and it's really hard sometimes to parent them, congratulations. Because you have, did you really want to raise a kid who didn't feel? Adolescence is a time where when you have intense feelings, it can be overwhelming until you learn to manage them, but those are the people who end up being the most successful people in the world. So this is not our goal in vulnerability. It's managing. Resilience isn't a character trait. It's not something you're born with. It's something that's supported by supports and circumstances in your life. I can tell you everything we know about resilience while standing on one foot. 60 years of resilience research. The kids who make it are the kids who have had at least one adult who believe in them unconditionally and hold them to high expectations. Who's that adult supposed to be? That's supposed to be you. What does unconditional belief mean? Is that like, dude, it's okay to do drugs? 
It's not what I'm talking about. It's I'm not going anywhere. You can rely on my presence. You are not a bumper sticker in my car or a reflection of me. I am there for you, and you can count on it no matter what. What does high expectations mean? Is that about grades? Is that about trophies? Is that about how many dance recitals you get? Absolutely not. What every kid needs is a human being who knows them, who sees them, for whom they're not invisible. If you see your child in terms of what they produce instead of who they are, that is not unconditional belief, and you are not doing what ideally you should be doing as a parent. As a parent, you should be building their character. There is only one person who knows how delicious your kids are, and that's you. So when you look at like my kids, I have identical girls, they're 19. They're the girls, and so during the adolescent years, we had moments, they were great, but they were, we had moments. But let me tell you who they are. They're the little girls who stopped by the side of the road and picked up the pink teddy bear to give it a teddy bear bath. They're the girls who wouldn't let us turn off the, uh, the, the lights in the summertime in the house because there were moths inside, and they were worried that the moths would get lost. So we had, seriously, we had to turn off the inside lights turn on the outside lights, and walk the moths out with flashlights so they could be with their moth grandmas. That is how delicious my girls are. And the fact that I know them, really know who they are, means that during the worst of times, I hold them to that expectation of the beauty inside of them. That is what every child needs. When you get your kids turned into adolescence, and you begin talking about high-yield conversations, and you begin, I want to make sure they're not doing drugs, I want to make sure that they're not having sex, I want to make sure that they get into a top college. Then you are to begin talking about what they do or what they produce instead of what, who they are, and you as parents are the most protective people in the life when you know who they are. All right? That's everything there is about resilience. The rest is commentary. All right? But we have another hour and a half, so let's keep going. Um, this is the American Academy of Pediatrics model in resilience. This is my model. It has been stolen largely from the youth development folks. But the first thing we need is we need kids to have confidence. And we knew exactly how to give kids confidence. We had the self-esteem movement. All right? So what did the self-esteem movement look like? We wanted to make sure that every kid felt really, really good about themselves. So what did that look like? So the first thing that we did is we, had, um, we taught teachers how to praise them incessantly. So you would, the first thing of day of kindergarten, you would draw butterflies. And when you would draw butterflies, the teachers would go around and notice something special about every butterfly. Look at you. You're yellow. It's so good. And look at those dots. And look at those big eyes. And then what would happen is the butterflies would go on the wall, and the lesson of the day was? You know what that lesson was? Each of you, you're special and beautiful as a butterfly. Number two, day number two, is you would, draw, you would cut out snowflakes. And the lesson for the day, and all of them were different, and the lesson for the day was each of you, you're? You're as unique as a snowflake. So every kid felt as special as a butterfly and as unique as a snowflake. And then what happened is that parents were taught to praise everything they did. You should stop. You should stay at the bottom of the um, sliding board, and you should just scream as the kid comes down, Tommy, Tommy, you're so good. You're so brave. You're so smart. Look at you. You never gave attention to gravity, right? It was all about Tommy. It was all about what he was doing. So every kid felt special as a butterfly, unique as a snowflake, and in charge of everything in their environment. And how did it end up? The most anxious, depressed group of kids we've ever seen in our life. All right? Why? Do you ever have those days where you don't feel special as a butterfly? Do you have those days? Right? And what happened is we didn't tell kids that it wasn't okay. And then what happened is we made kids incredibly anxious because they thought that they could control everything in their environment and they were in charge. And you know what? You can't. Um, real confidence comes from competence. It comes from noticing what kids are doing right and not undermining them when things are not going well and talking to them. We're going to talk about this later. Talking so that you understand they're the experts in their own lives and you help them figure things out rather than you impose your views. Competence. Next, connection. We've talked about this. Bottom line is that the kids who make it are the kids who are connected with um, adults and or connected with other kids as well. Next is character. Having an understanding of what is right and wrong. Included in this kind of character is the grit, having the tenacity. We know, we've known that from the marshmallow studies in the 60s or 70s, that if you could delay gratification, you are more likely to be successful 30 years later. We've known that. The challenge is how do we get kids to learn these things? Next is contribution, tikkun olam, to be completely committed to repairing the world. 
So what, why does this matter? It matters because the um, ultimate act of resilience is to turn to another human being and say, brother, I need a hand. The person who's going to make it is the person who can reach out and be supported by other people. What is it that's going to allow you to reach out and be supported without shame or stigma? It is the feeling that there's no shame in the room. No one wants to be someone else's project. No one wants there to be pity in the room. So what you want to do is prepare your kids to be able to receive when they need to. And what you're going to be able to, the best way to do that is to have a kid understand that uh, um, it feels good to give. It feels really good to give. And in fact, um, when you give, you're usually doing it because of how good it feels to serve another human being. And when you know that, and you learn that because of volunteering or whatnot, when you learn that, it means that when you need to take, you can take without shame or stigma. Now you can care for me because I know you're doing this not because you pity me, not because you look down on me, but because it gives you pleasure, much as I've had pleasure. But it's more than that. Um, uh, teenagers are held to low expectation, all of them. As they walk down the street, maybe not at this school, but as they walk down the street, teenagers are seen as feckless, as thoughtless. If you are a person of color, then your children are seen as dangerous. Okay? This is poison. This is toxic. The reason you want your kids to be um, out there serving the community, helping the neighbor um, you know, shovel snow, is you want that child to be surrounded by thank yous rather than condemnation. It is profoundly protective when that child is um, surrounded in that way. Next is coping. We're going to spend half an hour, I'm going to try to save half an hour for just talking about coping, because here's the bottom line. If Aaron, if you had asked me to come and to give a talk on eating disorders, if you had asked me to talk about um, cutting, about drug prevention, about delayed se I would, sex, I would have, I'd be giving you the same talk, guys. Because if you don't understand stress and the factors that cause stress in a community, then you don't understand why kids choose behaviors. And telling kids what not to do simply is meaningless. You show them what to do through your own behavior and self-care, and then you also show them what to do. And that's why those of you who are here with parents of th as parents of three-year-olds, you're here at the right time. And then finally is control. Kids either believe that the world happens to them or they believe that they control their universe. So how are you disciplining? Because discipline means to teach, right? Doesn't mean to control. Absolutely doesn't mean to harm. Means to teach. How are you disciplining? Are you disciplining in the way that says, you'll do what I say. Why? What's the answer to that? How were we raised? Because I said so. That makes kids feel small. And they're angels, by the way. They're perfect angels until they stop being angels. Okay? Or do the, does the kid understand that the freedoms I get, that the privileges I have, are earned through my behavior? All right? Next. So, that, so, so that's what gives kids control, is that they know that their um, choices um, that they make are what um, get them privileges. But next, what's our goal with kids? Is our goal to have our kids be independent? I think the American goal is about rugged individualism. It's about really getting our kids to really be independent and to be able to stand on their own. And I think it's a social experiment that's doomed to fail. I think that every culture that has been strong has always thrived on interdependence. And I, my girls just left for college, and you know what? Um, I want them to want to spend as much time with me as they can in their life. I would love them to have um, raised their families around the corner for me. I would really love that. I think that's a really, really healthy thing to do. Do I want them to live in my basement? No. So what is it that is going to create interdependence in our families? It's honoring independence during adolescence. When you install control buttons during adolescence by telling kids what they need to do, and if they don't, then they're disappointing you, or you do it, why, because I said so, then you install control buttons. And when your kid gets out of your house for college, that kid's not coming back. Coming home for, you know, the holidays and coming home for Thanksgiving. That's it. They're not going to come home. What you want, if you instead, if your kid understands that you honor their growing independence, that your goal is for them to stand on their own, then you, they won't have the control buttons. They'll say, you know what? They always gave me good advice. They always supported me. I'd like to hang out with them some more. All right? This is our real goal. So these are the seven C's of resilience. The one that's most important is connection. Importance can't be overstated. So let's talk about that. 
Why does it feel like our connection is challenged during adolescence? Let's think about this first. So I want you to think of every developmental milestone like a kid is crossing a 12-foot chasm, right? It's a 12-foot chasm, and then at the bottom, there are rusty metal spikes, and there are alligators on the bottom. And how do I get to the other side? So you might say, I'd like to, I'd like to build my child a bridge, right? But, but they're going to knock you down. So how do you get to the other side? You jump from where? Because looking down is too scary. And this is not new. So think when your kid was 11 months old and he or she took the first step, right? And as soon as um, she took her first step, what did she do? She fell down and you went to pick her up. And she wanted to say, gosh, mom, thank you so much because these legs are kind of wobbly, so I sure do appreciate the support. And then when she was two years old, she had those two-word sentences. And she was, um, but she was so smart, right? She had so much to say, and she just couldn't get it out of her mouth. I'm not smart like other mothers thought their child was smart. Like, yours was really special. And so what you did is you finished her sentences for her, and she wanted to say, gosh, Mom, thank you so much. I'm having articulation difficulties. But what did she do instead? She swatted you away and said, no, me. And now she's 15 years old, and she... Um, um, is go about to go on her first date, and you decide to have the talk with her, right? Way too late, okay? But you decide to have the talk with her, and what she wants to say is, gosh, Dad, thank you so much, because there's, you know, just last year I thought you were the sexiest man alive, and there's nobody I'd rather learn about healthy male sexuality from than you. <laughs> but what does she say instead? Ew! Um, and have, has anyone had a kid go to college yet? All right. That last summer, it is so special. It's when you have those mother-son dates, right, where you get to really talk about feelings and make sure you've taught him everything that you need. Like, does he know not to run with scissors? So you just want these dates, and then you ask him for these dates, and then what does um, he say? Like, he's like, oh, no, you're, I'm not going to see Sheila till Thanksgiving. I have to spend every minute with her. And then right before he goes out off to college, what does he want to do? He wants to say to you, Mom, Dad, thank you so much. You know, you've taught me everything. You've prepared me for the world. You've, you've literally changed me, and you've tutored me, and you've supported me in so many ways. Do you think I'm ready for the academic pressures, the social pressures, the emotional pressures, even the sexual pressures? Can I call you several times a day? But what does he say instead? I'm out of this prison. <laughs> so let's talk about what's happening. What's happening is that um, your kids are being raised in this wonderful, comfortable nest with one or two big, fat birds bringing them big, fat, juicy worms. And life is good. And then something happens in the beginning of adolescence where a gland inside your head goes off and says, you know what? Your body's beginning to change. And that's a signal that you're going to need to fly from the nest. And when that happens, suddenly you need for that nest to not look so comfortable because who on earth would want to leave a nest that, that is that comfortable? So suddenly you have to begin to see that nest as kind of prickly, right? Think 13, 14-year-old girl. You know, that nest is kind of prickly. And another thing, you know, um, all of a sudden, um, those big uh, uh, birds that brought those fat, juicy worms, they're not going to be bringing them forever. So you have to kind of resent that they're doing this for you, and you'd really prefer them to be invisible. All right? And then suddenly, right before they're ready to go off to college, when they're really going to leap, which is, by the way, the hardest developmental task of your lifetime, is answering the question, who am I, and now I'm going to be on my own. It is the hardest developmental task of your lifetime. It is why adolescence is designed to be about risk-taking. If it's not about risk-taking, how can you possibly take the risk, biggest risk of your life? Your job is to make sure that you allow your kids to take risk-taking in areas that are safe, like academics, and not take er um, risk-taking in areas that are not safe, like doing drugs and driving drunk. Okay? But they're going to have to take risk-taking. And when you put so much pressure on them to fit inside of a box academically and say it's far too serious for your kid to take any risks, don't be surprised when they think they have permission to take risks in other categories. They've got to take risks because they've got to fly from that nest. They have to see that nest as absolutely uninhabitable before they leave. So the reason that your kid hates you during adolescence is because they love you so much it hurts. And if you really own that and really know that, you can handle anything. All right? The reason they're pushing against you is not because they've stopped loving you. It's because they love you so much it is painful.
And when you know that, everything becomes better. And you will stop going up against your kid when he comes up against you. Instead, you'll understand what he's doing, back up, and love him even more. Listening. In terms of connection, there is nothing more important than listening. So what do you have to do to be able to um, listen to your kids? You need to um, turn off a couple of instinctual things that you do. The first thing is turn off the parent alarm. The parent alarm goes like this. Um, Mom, I met this girl. You're too young today. Mom, my friend Paul, he's using drugs, which is why I told you never to ever uh, talk to Paul again. Here are conversations about sex and drugs that you will never have. Because if you've reacted, your kid's not talking to you. Another thing we do is we catastrophize. Mom, I got a D on a test, and I think it's because the teacher's completely unfair and didn't pay any attention to me. Well, you know what? He always had it against you. I'm going to go to the headmaster. We're going to get him fired if we need to. We will get you tutoring in four different subjects, and, but especially this one. We'll get twice a week, and we will um, move if we have to. And the other thing is over-empathy. Mom, I had this really big fight with Shoshana, and she was like my best friend ever, and I was sure that she was going to be, like we were going to live next door to each other, and her kids were going to call me aunt, and my kids were going to call her aunt, and now I think I hate her. Well, I don't blame you. She's a little bitch, and I don't like her mother. <laughs> so who is Shoshana the next day? Yeah, but you'll never know because you've reacted. Kids love drama with their friends and hate drama with their parents. And if you bring drama into the situation, instead of being a, you know, someone to bounce ideas off of, then don't be surprised when your kids um, will, not, will stop talking to you. And when we talk about monitoring, um, you're going to see that that's the most important thing in order for you to be able to monitor your kid. Now, we got about 20 minutes of pain. This is what's wrong with this community, is what we're talking about. Your style of what you want to do, you've got all the solution down. But I am not worried about your kids becoming gang members. I am seriously worried that your kids will not like themselves because they feel they have to be good at everything. So let's talk about how not to make this happen and what happens. So the first thing is, what is perfectionism and why isn't it a good thing? So if this was a concert hall and there were 800 people in the room, and um, I played a great concerto, and um, I got a standing ovation. The high achiever, which is what you want your kids to be, would look around and say, what a blessing it is to be able to um, serve people like this, doing something you love. The perfectionist notices only one thing. She's sitting down. That's all the perfectionist notices. And furthermore, the perfectionist not thinks she must be the person who knows the most, because I, I don't belong here anyway. They all have imposter syndrome. I'm playing soccer, and I get three goals. The high achiever is on his buddy's shoulders, and he's celebrating. The perfectionist is thinking um, that corner shot went wide. The last thing you want is for your kid to be a perfectionist. What you want is for them to be a high achiever. So what are perfectionists like? They loathe themselves. They are terrified of getting a B plus because they think they have to be good at absolutely everything. They fear the D word. Because you're not beating your children anymore, and you shouldn't be, but because you're not, what we do instead is we get disappointed. Darling, I'm so disappointed in you. And these kids freak out to the word disappointed, all right? Um, and when you fear the B+, plus and you fear disappointing people, you're not going to have any out-of-the-box thought. If you're not going to have any out-of-the-box thought, that is the death of creativity. Perfectionists um, have... Uh, uh, perfectionists have... Um, uh, uh, a fear of constructive feedback because they have imposter syndrome. They don't believe they're as good as they ever were. Let's talk about why failure, or as people told them were. Let's talk about why failure is such an important thing. If you look at industry, in this innovative industry now, they are not just measuring their successes, they are measuring their failures. So if you only measure your successes, they might be right here. And in the old days, you would say, great, we're not wasting any energy on things that don't work. But in the world as it exists now, you do not feel good about yourself as an industry until you begin experiencing failures. And when you begin experiencing failures, you know that you've stretched as far as you can go, that your target area is larger, and you know exactly where your research and development needs to go to overcome the failures. So measuring failures is key 
to being able to succeed. Failure is not a bad word, all right? What is a bad word is feeling like you have to be perfect, all right? So this is the time for your kids to learn how to fail and recover. And what I got today, to be honest with you talking, is that everybody knows this in this school, and, but then when you get to high school, people still have the culture of, but it counts now, which means you can't fail. And again, you listen to me, your kids' chances of getting into Stanford might go down. Your kids' chances of succeeding in the rest of their life shoots way up. So let's think about, let's use me as an example. Um, I am a full professor at a um, Ivy League medical school, um, that, and my hospital is supposed to be the best hospital in the world. So I've got good credentials. I am 28 years out of medical school, and the first thing that you learn in, in medical school when you go onto the wards is how to read an EKG, all right? Um, because that's how you can tell the difference between something that is like real heart disease versus not real heart disease. 